So two weeks ago for the last installment of our enthralling Acts sermon series, we learned about Peter's vision from God that revealed the way of salvation being open to Gentiles, to non-Jews, to anyone with faith in Christ. And so to catch you up following his vision and report to the Jerusalem council, Peter then gets put in jail by King Herod, which happens to be a common theme in the book of Acts. And then God sends God's angels to free Peter from jail. From there, Peter kind of fades into the background of the Acts narrative. And Saul, who the text begins referring to as Paul, becomes the new protagonist. And the next several chapters are filled with all sorts of place names detailing Paul's journeys around the Mediterranean with his partner missionary Barnabas. In every city, they first go into the synagogues and they interpret the Hebrew scriptures to show that those scriptures foresaw Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah and that he died and was raised from the dead and, and through faith in him, God offers the forgiveness of sins. And it follows this pattern where typically their message is is often celebrated and accepted at least among some portion of the Gentile God-fearers. That is, those who already had some respect for the God of Israel and, and for the moral aspects of the Torah, while... Again, the pattern shows that the Jewish leaders almost always respond with hostility. At one point, Paul and Barnabas are stoned and left for dead. Yet another common theme in the book of Acts. Later, in chapter 15, there is another big church council meeting in Jerusalem about whether the Gentile believers should be circumcised and whether they should be made to follow the law of Moses. They debate about it for a while and and come to the conclusion that no, what is required for them is to be baptized and to observe some basic parts of the Torah. There's this little one of Paul's letters that is actually in Acts that you don't, it's like a microscopic version of most of Paul's other work that is part of the epistles that follow Acts which basically says that they do need to um, abstain from offering food to idols and certain kinds of food and certain kinds of sexual immorality. But then from there, Paul goes back on a second journey through some of the same places where he preached on his first trip to kind of check back in on those fledgling churches, those new Christian communities that he and Barnabas had planted. Uh, The only difference, though, is that he ends up having an argument with Barnabas, and he goes with a new partner, with Silas, and then another partner, Timothy, instead. And Philippi, the next thing that happens is Paul and Silas Get thrown in jail once again for disturbing the peace. You you see, they had met this girl who had a demon which annoyed Paul, so he exercised the demon. The catch was this girl with the demon was a means of making money for the owners who, who owned this slave girl. And so when the demon leaves, their way of making money is gone. So they're not too happy with Paul and Silas. So they drag them in front of the authorities who throw them in jail for disturbing the peace. And once again... God miraculously frees them from prison and they end up converting the jailer and his family in the process. From there, they go on to Thessalonica, as Tony read, where they end up ticking off the Jewish authorities in that city too. And once again, they have to run for their lives. 
And as Tony's reading picks up, they, they go and they preach in Berea, but they're not safe there either. They all end up getting separated, and, and Paul goes all the way to Athens, where he really has no intention of doing any evangelistic work. He's just waiting there for Silas and Timothy to join him. But then he sees all these idols in the city, and you know, he's a preacher, and he just can't help himself. He just has to preach. Preachers gone preach, as I like to say. This is one of the few speeches or sermons in Acts that, that Tony read for us that Paul gives to an audience that doesn't have any Jews in it. It is an entirely secular, or an entirely non-Jewish, rather, audience, not, not secular. Paul, though, knows his audience. You see, so many of the other speeches and acts are, are chock full of Old Testament quotations, scriptures that he's interpreting and reinterpreting. But in this sermon, Paul does something different. He quotes Greek poetry. He quotes it twice, in fact. That famous line about the God in whom we live and move and have our being. And that other line about being God's offspring. That was part of the Greek cultural canon, if you will. The other interesting thing about this sermon is that he never explicitly mentions Jesus or his crucifixion to this audience who would be described as maybe only vaguely having heard of Jesus. In the end... The reaction that he receives, once again, is mixed. Some blow him off and, and make fun of him, but others are moved and intrigued by what they've heard. We will hear you again on this, they say. One thing about this passage that strikes me is the apparent disconnect between Paul's inner monologue between Paul's thoughts and what he says out loud, what he communicates to the people of Athens. In verse 16, we read that, that what makes Paul speak up, what makes him get involved in Athens instead of just keeping his head down and waiting for Silas, is that he was distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. But this observation that, that Paul makes in his head is very different than the observation he shares with his audience. He sees, man, this city is full of idols. What he says out loud, though, is, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. Sort of like one of those backhanded, sort of passive compliments. That's maybe what we would say if, if we wanted to be cynical, that, that Paul was just being inauthentic. I see how extremely religious you are in every way. That he's just holding back, that he's just flattering his audience. But after reflecting on it, and reflecting on our own experience of being Christians in a pluralistic world, I sincerely think that Paul is being sincere. What Paul noticed was a deficiency. What Paul noticed was a shortcoming. Let's just say it. What Paul noticed was a sin but he reframes that to be an asset. He doesn't say, man, you guys don't know how to worship. You worship so many idols. He says, I can see 
that you are religious in every way. I can see that God is important to you. Paul also declares that that God made the nations in such a way that people would search for God and ultimately find God, which again is a reframe. It's a way to reinterpret another one of his internal observations. And at this point, I think in his mind, he really is being cynical when when he observes that, that the people in Athens spent their time doing what intellectuals do. That is a whole lot of nothing besides conversing about whatever is new or whatever is hip. So he reframes that, and that becomes Paul's entry point. He basically says, let me tell you something new about something old. Or maybe let me tell you something old about something new. (laughs) This God that you recognize exists but is unknown, that God has been made known. That God wants everyone to change their hearts and be reconciled. That God is a good God who made heaven and earth. That God is a righteous judge who will finally judge and wipe out forever all the forces that alienate us that will destroy everything that causes suffering, that will eliminate all violence and fear and injustice. This God will defeat death forever so that our bodies and our entire selves can be redeemed and resurrected and made perfect. Paul takes what was in his mind as a judgment, a sarcastic, throwaway stereotype, wrestles with it, redeems it, and uses it as a way to preach to the people. He's able to get there with his authority Athenian audience, because he observed something that disturbed him and chose to reframe it in a holy way. He chose to love instead of judge. I would suggest that this is the meaning of loving one's neighbor. This is what it looks like in practice to observe that second greatest commandment that Jesus declared to love one's neighbor as oneself is to choose to see that which is good and admirable and celebrate it. If Paul couldn't move past his observation that there were idols everywhere, he never could have connected with the people of Athens. I know when I have preached on this text before, and I know when many preachers preach this text, we fixate on the idols on the images of stone or silver and gold. And, and we say this text is, is calling us to name the idols that, that we ourselves worship, if it is a good sermon, or idols that just the culture worships, if maybe it's a not-so-good sermon. But that's not what Paul does. Paul goes into this culture that is foreign and idolatrous and he chooses to find a point of connection. This election that we just had 
reveals, if nothing else, that neither political perspective in our country will easily be defeated or go away. We are basically two different cultures. And we are so good at pointing out the other culture's idols. I know I am really good at pointing out the other culture's idols. We do that so well, calling out the idols we see in others. Racism, political correctness, bigotry, elitism, hypocritical religiosity, self-righteous judgmentalism. How can we find a connection point? How can we reframe those perceived deficiencies and choose love? How can we choose to see the good? How can we get to a point where we can be forgiven? Where we can be reconciled? My intention today was to give you a sermon where I would present you the answer. (laughs) If only it were that easy. I don't have the answer. I am as broken and sinful and guilty of it as anyone. But like Paul, I believe fully in my heart to the core of my being and a God who wants us to be reconciled. Who wants us to repent. And who promises to judge not with mighty judgmentalism, not with self-righteousness, but with righteousness. Holiness, love. And that is the reason why I keep getting up here and and giving these sermons that I promise you are just as awkward and uncomfortable for me as they are for you. Because I believe that even when we fail at this, Even when we fail at seeing the good and striving for reconciliation, God's acceptance will not. God's love will not. Division will not win. Hatred will not win. God's love overcomes all. Amen.